In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the one God to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the world, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. And in the name of his true servant and last messenger, our beloved leader, teacher, and guide, the messenger of Allah, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, I greet you, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace in the Arabic language. Assalamu alaikum. To Minister Lin Watt, Brothers and sisters of the FOI and MGT of Temple Number no. 7, New York City, Muslim brothers and sisters who are here tonight that I haven't seen in many years, but as I look into your faces, I see those that love the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and worked faithfully and diligently and sacrificed much to build the nation of Islam under his leadership. And I'm very happy and honored and humbled by your presence this evening. And to those who are standing on the outside of this building, not being able to come in, I'm grateful to Allah for the privilege, the opportunity, and the honor of being able to speak to you from the inside and I hope that your feet won't get too tired standing on the outside. I don't intend to hold you too long. But we are happy and honored to be here in Brooklyn. I guess we could say Brooklyn is now the capital of black America. And we are grateful that those who rented this humble place rented it to the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad who are busy now remodeling this place to make it fit to receive you that we may once again lift up the name of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his teachings among us. There's so much that I want to say to you, but I want to start first by saying this. Islam is not a personality cult, nor is it a group of uh, people who are followers of Farrakhan. I'm speaking to those here in this house. We are followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We bear witness to the greatness of his leadership. And we acknowledge that it is only his leadership that proved over 40 years that he had the best program, the most viable program for the elevation of black people, for the productiveness of black people, and to guide black people in America and throughout the world in the proper way of doing for self and ultimately to carve out a nation of self for black people. New York is my home. New York is where I was born, though it is not where I grew up. But New York is where I worked for 10 years on behalf of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad after I was sent here by the messenger after the assassination 
of Malcolm X. It is a joy to me to come home. And it is a joy to me to be in Brooklyn. And I want you to know if it be the will of Allah that I shall be back every Wednesday for the next six weeks. There are many things we want to take up with you. And I think the audience that is here tonight, so many of you whom I soldiered with, you must try to understand, beloved brothers and sisters, what has happened to our nation and why. You know, you may know what happened, but if you don't know why, you're not comforted. So many people, when something of a calamitous nature strikes and it happens all of a sudden, people ask the question, why? Why did this happen? Why to me? I've been doing good or I've been good. Why should this calamity afflict me? Sometimes we may lose someone very dear to us, a young child perhaps. And when a mother has to bury her son or her daughter at a very young age, the mother and the father oftentimes ask the question, why? The child was so young. Why, God, did you take my child from me? So many people not understanding the ways of God, not understanding how he works, because we don't have a comprehensive knowledge of things. We have a very limited knowledge of things. And so in our limited knowledge, as we reach out for the whys, the answers to these perplexing problems and calamities, some of us get so offended by the loss that we become blinded by the loss and then we turn our backs on God as though God did us something wrong. We couldn't take the strain, we couldn't take the pain of seeing something and someone dear to us leave us. We couldn't take the pain, we didn't want the strain of knowing that that person or that thing was no longer there. And then we became offended at God. Why did you bring us all this way to leave us? Why, Elijah Muhammad, did you preach among us for 44 long years? And after we had built up confidence in you, we learned that you were dead. And now everything that you taught, that you built, has been toned down. Yes. Think about it. Why? I gave my money. I went to prison. I lost my loved ones. For God's sake, somebody tell me why. I gave my heart and my mind to a man like I never gave to no other man who ever lived. And now my hopes are dashed. Somebody give me some understanding. Somebody tell me why. Yes, and if the why doesn't come quick enough, mm -hmm. the hurt turns to bitterness. Yes, come on. And then out of the bitterness of the loss and the pain and the anguish, we begin to curse that which we once loved. 
The love that we had for a man and his truth begins to wax cold. And then without hope, some of us fall backward into the mud, into the filth, into the old life, into the old habits. Some of us are not here tonight. Some are dead and gone. Some are in insane asylums because they couldn't answer the question why. Some have lost their wives, their children, their families, torn asunder. They couldn't answer the question why. And I say with deep humility, I had been taught at the foot of the messenger and I thought I really knew his teachings but at that moment in time I was helpless because I couldn't quite answer the question why yes. so I too stumbled and fell and I say this openly and unashamedly because I want to say to all of us who stumbled and fell that as Almighty God, Allah, has had mercy upon me and has, to say it in the scriptural language, an angel of the Lord came and rolled the stone away which allowed me to come back out of the tomb again. Then I can stand before you who fell and a nation who has fallen and a whole people who have fallen and say, Brothers and sisters, this is the final call. This is the final call. I want you to listen and pay very close attention to what we say tonight because it is the final call. All right, sir. Listen. When a train is getting ready to go, a plane is getting ready to take off, the man says, board it now. This is the final call for flight so and so and so and so. And if you are a traveler, you better get on board. So do all your hugging and your squeezing and your teasing and get on board. Well, this is the final call because the world that Elijah Muhammad warned us was going down. It don't take a wise man to see it's falling apart. And the black man and woman of America are suffering loss and ruin today because we didn't listen when the man was here. But I'm proud and pleased to say that Allah brought me back to life to call out to you for the last time to be a reminder to you of a holy one that was in our midst to be a reminder to you of a faithful warner and a faithful messenger and plead with you and beg you almost to take away to your Lord before it is too late why did it happen what did God have in mind? Allah introduces himself to us in the Holy Quran. In the second surah, he begins. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. I, Allah, am the best Noah. He introduces himself to us as one who knows best. He's telling us, trust me, it'll work out right. I know best. And some of the most critical chapters in the book, he introduces with those same words, I know best. Mama used to tell us that when she gave us castor oil. I know best, child. Take your castor oil. Take your three sixes. Take your black draught. I know best, child. This will move you. 
And sure enough, mama didn't know best. It was a painful experience. It was an excruciating experience. But after it was all over, we came out better for it because mama did know better than we know. Allah is saying to us, it is the nature of water and it is the nature of electricity and it is the nature of life to take a course of least resistance. You would not choose heavy trials for yourself. You would choose an easy road if you had to choose roads to travel. But since I, Allah talking, am the best knower and I want to make you a great people and I have carved out a future for you and caused the prophets to prophesy of what your future would be. I must take you by a way that you knew not so that every twist and turn in the road will bring out of you something that you didn't even know was in you until when I get through with the twists and the turns in the road with the ups and the downs and the hills and the valleys. I'm going to take you through trial and tribulation, through pain and affliction. But when I get finished with you, you'll be like purified gold. So pure that you'll be a perfect conductor of my Holy Spirit because I've chosen you for my own service. But I never choose a people and give them an easy road. When I choose somebody, I make it hard for them because I know best what is good for my choice. You say, I don't believe it. I chose Abraham. I didn't give Abraham an easy road. I chose Moses and he wanted to quit before he began because he knew the road was rough. I chose Daniel, but I put him in a lion's den. I chose the Hebrew boys, but I threw them in the furnace. I chose Jesus, but I had him crucified. Because when I choose you, I don't choose you for an easy road. I choose you to go a road that you wouldn't go yourself, but I, I am the best no. But if you're patient with me, if you persevere through your trial, if you can take the down like you took the up, if you can take the have not like you took the have, if you can take the sorrow like you took the joy, if you can lose whatever you have and then ask me why, but still don't doubt me and still don't get offended when you curse me, then I'm going to bring you out after I try you. Oh, praise the Jesus to Allah. Oh, praise the Jesus to Allah. And as I told my servant, your latter state will be better than your former state. Have you considered my servant Job? Job was my man. God talking the best Noah. Job was my man. I loved him. But Satan and the children of God came to present themselves before me. My own children didn't know that Satan was among them. They were walking with Satan. I had to call a stop to that because I was the best known. I said, whence cometh thou, Satan? <laughs> Satan had to speak. The children of God said, what? Satan is among us? I thought that was brother so-and-so. I thought that was sister so-and-so. coming down Satan he said well I come from walking up and down uh-huh. going to and fro in the earth seeking whom I may devour uh-huh. devour mean eat up uh-huh. 
Eat up means make a part of my system that it strengthens and nourishes my aim and my purpose. Satan is always looking for someone to eat up to make them a part of his crookedness that the power and essence of your being be used for a cause that is against yourself. Satan had eaten everybody up. He had gobbled up the planet. But the Lord looked at Satan and said, Hey, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> Satan said, What about him? He said, He, he loved me. That's right. That's right. And he, uh, he eschews evil. Yes, Satan said, Oh, shoot. The only reason you, lo you love him and he love you is because you give him everything. Remove that hedge from around him and let me get to him. And I'll show you, God, I'll make him crush you to your face. The same challenge is repeated in the Holy Quran under the name Iblis. God chooses a man and he makes the angels bow to the man that he chose. And Iblis did not. And Allah said to Iblis in the Quran, what hindered you that you did not submit when I commanded you? And here's a man rebellious to God's command. Then he speaks back to God. He says, I didn't submit because this one is made of dust or he's made of black mud fashioned into shape. I'm made of fire. I'm better than he is. Don't you know me, God? I'm the wise one. I'm the righteous one. And you took something from dust. You took something from black mud. You took a filthy thing and put him above me. I'm angry with you. That's why I didn't submit, because I'm better. The wicked always think in their sick, self-righteous heart that they are better than the one whom God chooses. So God want to show you you're not as good as you think you are. And I'll prove it by the trial. I'm going to take the hedge from around you, Joe. And since you don't want to submit to my servant, I'm going to give you a respite. I'm going to give you time. I'm going to delay your doom. And I'm going to set you on a course. And the devil said to Allah in the Quran, in words, thank you for respiting me or delaying my doom. But now I'm going to lie in wait for them in that straight path. I'm not going to come in the crooked path because everything in the crooked path is already mine. But I'm going after them that's in the straight path. I want to take those who say they believe in you. I want to take those who say they set up no God beside you. Those are the ones I want to make deviate. And Allah says, go to it, man. Not quite like that, of course. And Satan says to Allah, he says, I'm going to come at them from their right side and from their left side, from before them and from behind them. And I will make all of them deviate. Notice the word. I will make all of them deviate. Allah said to Satan, go to it. But whosoever follows you, I will certainly fill hell with you all. In other words, I want you to know, Satan, I got some knees that won't bow to you. I want you to know, Satan, that he's my man, but I'm going to let you try him. He said, the only condition I put down is spare his life. Do anything to him you want to. Don't take his life. Satan says, it's a deal. 
Let's make a deal, the price is right. Now, brothers and sisters, the history of Job is a beautiful history because Job lost everything. He lost his cattle. He lost the land that he had. He lost his family. He lost his health. Even his wife told him, curse God and die. His friends turned on him and said, look, man, you must have done something wrong. God wouldn't do nothing like this to you. You the wrongdoer. Fess up, fess up. Tell it, tell it, man. Look, brother, you don't know when you got friends. You don't know who your friends are. You think you got friends when you got money. You think you have friends when you have power. But when your power is gone, uh-huh. and when your money is gone, uh-huh. and when you can't do nothing for nobody or to nobody, that's when you find out who your friends really are. And that's when Job found out. Job looked up and he looked deep into human nature because he had to get a lesson in human nature. He had to understand why his family He's a righteous man and his family is all messed up. Man, that's something to think about. A righteous man with an unrighteous family. A righteous man whose family loved to party and boogie and get on down. So while his family was boogieing and getting on down, a whirlwind came and swung the house. Killed them all except one. And Job saw one of his children running to him to tell him all the family is gone. How did Job take it? He got down so low. He used these words, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now look, those are words but they embody a deep principle that you have no children except by God's grace. And if God give you a child and let you enjoy the loveliness and the beauty and the warmth of that child for six months, for a year, and you lose the child, you shouldn't curse God. You should thank God for the year that you have. Do you understand? That's the way to look at it. Sure, we're sad to see the life go, but thank you a lot for the life that you gave me. We have to be able to withstand trials in order to grow into perfection. The Quran asks the Muslims, and do men think that they will be left alone on saying we believe and will not be tried while others were tried before you. Nation of Islam, do you think that you can enter the garden while the like of that which befell others has not yet befallen you? And surely they were greatly tried and greatly shaken to such a degree that they cried out, when will the help of Allah come? Could the nation of Islam that had grown from the work of Elijah Muhammad, from the suffering of Elijah Muhammad, from the sacrifice of Elijah Muhammad, Uh and the early strugglers in Islam, they made it possible for the nation to be the nation of Islam. And though many black people didn't subscribe to Mr. Muhammad's religious philosophy, They admired his educational program, his economic program. They loved the unity and the cohesiveness of the brothers, the courtesy that they displayed, the righteousness that we tried to carry into practice. They loved the sisters in the 
red garment. How proudly you walk the streets of New York. And the junkies and the winos step back to show you respect and honor. You remember? But you and I had to be tried. Jesus was going up, up, up. And I mean, I guess to the people that looked at Jesus, they said, man, look at him. He's making the deaf hear, the dumb speak, the lame walk. He's raising the dead to life. Ooh, before long, everybody going to believe in him. They didn't know what was laying around the corner. Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. People saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. They didn't know that a few days later the people would be saying, crucify him. Crucify him. I was here in New York with you. And God knows I love you. And he also knows that you love me. Yeah, most of you did. I speak in the past tense. But you know, God have a way of warming things up again that turn cold when understanding comes. Look, brothers and sisters, your love is precious. Hear me well. We took the temple in New York. Brothers and sisters in this audience right here tonight, after the assassination of Malcolm X, we could hardly hold our head up in the street. Anywhere we walked, there go one of them Muslims, they kill Malcolm. It was years before Muslims got any kind of respect at all. But we worked hard, brothers and sisters, under the guidance of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. They burned down our temple. On 116th Street, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad came back and built it up more beautiful than ever to say to the hypocrites, you will not run us out of New York. We are here to stay. And in that lovely house on 116th Street, we had good times and bad times. We had ups and downs. Because when you're on a road that leads to paradise, you can't have it one way all the time. God got to give you valleys and hills, low places and high places, ups and downs to see what kind of servant you're going to be. Brother, in 1974, when 70,000 people came out to Randall's Island, the largest crowd ever gathered in the history of New York for a black event. Yes, sir. That's right. All black people. Nation of Islam flag flying all over Randall's Island. So many people I couldn't get there in my car. They had to go get a helicopter because the bridge they said was too crowded for me to come over the bridge. And when I went to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, told him of this mighty crowd, yes, repeated again in September, 40,000 out there. Yes, sir. And I'm sitting with the messenger, yes, and I'm happy, you know. Oh boy, the apostle, the people love you. They want to hear your teaching. He just looked at me real sad. And he said, as God is my witness, he said, brother, the time is coming when you may go to the temple and you will not find a believer there other than yourself. I looked at him and I mean, I know he's the messenger and I know he's telling the truth, but inside I don't quite believe it. I said, how could this be? With all those people, mosques full, Bronx mosques full, Brooklyn mosques full, Manhattan mosques full. We had 18 mosques in the city, yes. all of them full of people. Yes, right. And it looked like we were busting out of all the walls. Yes, right. 
How could it be that it was going to go all the way down to nothing? How could I go to the house that we built? And there would be no believers there. I couldn't see. But he knew tomorrow better than I knew yesterday. And that's why there is no leader for black people but a visionary. And Elijah Muhammad is no blind guy. He saw tomorrow better than you see yesterday. And he carved out a path for us to walk if all we would do is see where he went and put our foot down right after him. I'm telling you, we can rebuild the nation overnight. <laughs> overnight. All the guards on the front post don't change these posts no more. Unless it's an emergency. A man can't sit down for an hour. We don't need it. That's right. <laughs> us old folk, we remember the time when we would stand for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for six hours. Yes, sir. And didn't change no post. Old soldiers, you remember those days. Oh, look at these mighty soldiers. Do you know, beloved? I'm looking in your faces. Do you know we are lucky to be alive with what we've been through? Do you know we are lucky to be here? You don't have to show me your scars. I got plenty to show you too. I mean, we've been through hell to get here tonight. Let me go on. So after the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that to me, I came home and I told others. But I didn't know how it was going to happen. None of us, none of us believed that the son of Elijah Muhammad would take the nation off the course that the messenger put it on. All of us that were in the nation, we loved Wallace. Except some crazy folk who may have been jealous of his wisdom. He's no little lightweight fella. He's a very, very, very wise man. But he had a problem. And his problem was he really didn't love his daddy. And he didn't love Master Farad Muhammad. And deep down inside, he didn't believe. That his father was in fact the messenger of God. That's right. So if he didn't believe that, he should have left us alone. That's right. And gone on and established something that testifies to his great belief. Yes, sir. Since he believed that he's better than his father. Since he believed he's more wise than his father. Since he believed he's holier than his father, more clean, more fit for leadership of the people than his daddy, uh -huh. then leave your daddy alone and go on out in the field with your wisdom and bring up a house to the glory of Allah that will shame your father. But you didn't do that. No, he came right in the temple. Come on, right in. With a uniform on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, he did. Came back just a few months before they announced the death of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes, sir. And I say this with no malice because God has blessed me to overcome bitterness because I understand my bitterness. Yes, sir. Come on. The Quran teaches us that when Moses left to go to the mountain, the Samiri, S-A-M-I-R-I, the Samiri took the leadership from Aaron. <laughs> Aaron didn't mislead the people. He was overpowered by the Samiri. 
That's the Quran. I know what the Bible says. It got truth in it too. But the Quran vindicates Aaron. But the Samiri, they started and borrowed a few footprints, the Quran teaches. And then after a while, they discarded that. It means they followed the messenger a little way and then discarded that. Exactly what happened. That's right. When the new leadership came to power, they followed the messenger a few days. Yes, sir. Made it appear like they right with him. Yeah. Uh-huh. Think about and it. after a few days, they discarded everything that the messenger taught. Yes, That's right. The Jews on Christmas time have a holiday that they call Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a Jewish festival. They call it the Festival of Lights. But it's actually the observance of the retaking of the temple at Jerusalem and the purifying of that temple from the unlawful leadership of one called Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. Antiochus was not to be the leader. But through deceit, through cunning, through bribery, through flattery, he displaced the actual one and came to power. He was a Jew on the outside, but his heart was Greco-Roman. He loved Greece. He loved Rome. So when he came to power, being a Jew on the outside and a Greek on the inside, his heart was to destroy the Jewish way and reestablish or establish the Greek or Roman way among the Jews. Isn't that something? So the first thing he did was ban all Jewish literature. Go read it for yourself. It's in the library. You can check it out. He banned all Jewish literature. The second thing he did was close down all of the Jewish schools. You didn't hear me. The third thing he did, the third thing he did was rob the Jewish treasuries. The fourth thing he did was bring into the temple the abomination that bringeth desolation. Then he brought a hog in and slaughtered a pig on the altar of God. The man had got so way out that the Jews begin a spirit of rebellion. He even coined had a a, a coin minted with his face on it. And he called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphanes means the manifestation of God. But the people called him Antiochus Epimenes, and Epimenes means a madman. Pretty soon a man by the name of Judas Maccabeus arose. And the famous Maccabees that you read about in Jewish history began to assault Antiochus. They said, they said, that Antiochus was a curious mixture of wit and charm and insanity. They said he he used to go with sailors and stuff. That's what the book said about Antiochus. That's what the book said about Antiochus. That's history. But now, Daniel talks about it. Daniel says, 
And when the abomination that bringeth desolation standeth in the holy place. <coughs> know that the end is nigh. In a meeting of the national laborers, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us that the abomination that bringeth desolation stands for hatred. <clears throat> when someone would stand in the holy place filled with hatred for the God that the holy place remembered and the Messiah would be cut off. And the scholars say the Messiah's being cut off mean he would be without honor, without regard in his own house. When this happened, know that the end is come. I don't know, it could be coincidence. But it is true. That when the new leadership came to power, yeah. its first act was to tell all of the Muslims, put away the books of Elijah Muhammad. That's right. That's right. That's right. Put them away. Don't read them no more. Come to me. That's right. That's right. I didn't say it. He said it. That's right. Is that true? That's true. Right. The second thing he did was close up every one of the universities of Islam. Did he close them up? Close them all up. Close them all up. Come on. By June of 1976, at McCormick Place, it was announced that there was over $4 million in the number two poor treasury and that that last year over $22 million had come in on the fish alone. And if you remember Savior's Day 1974, the former National Secretary Abbas Rasul said that our income for the year 73-74 approached 50 million dollars in the nation of Islam. Come on. Now this is June 1976. 75. By February 1976, it was announced that the nation of Islam was broke. That the nation of Islam was five million dollars in debt. The picture was painted of mismanagement. The picture was painted of corrupt, rotten leadership that was ripping off the people's fish money, ripping off the people's charity. I don't doubt that there was some that who wanted to fatten themselves up on the suffering and the sacrifice of others. But I ask you a very pertinent question. Since the Honorable Elijah Muhammad bought us the most modern up-to-date press cash with one million dollars. He bought us 40,000 acres of land and we got together and bought him a jet plane at a cost of 1.2 million dollars. Cash. If somebody was ripping him off, he suddenly was able to make progress with the charity that the believers gave. Remember this now. Now they say the nation was worth over 80 million dollars. There is no corporation in America that does not function with some debt. Debt does not mean you are not soluble, you are not viable, you are not in business. General Motors has debt. Ford Motor Company has debt. Ask Chrysler, they've been in debt. American Motors is in debt. U.S. Steel is in debt. The United States government, according to President Reagan, <laughs> said,
said they wanted to raise the debt ceiling from $980 billion to a little over $1 trillion. That's the government debt. Come on. But if the government is $1 trillion in debt, and the country has a gross national product of two and a half times the national debt, then we say the country's economy could be viable. If the nation was $5 million in debt and had an income of $50 million in one year and assets of over $80 million, how could the nation be in bad shape. There is truth here that some of the businesses weren't doing well. We must tell the truth. And it wasn't doing well because of bad management. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was constantly searching for better managers. Kept an ad in the paper sending for qualified help. Because he knew a lot of his help was unqualified. But that don't mean the nation is bad. Certainly there were some corrupt people, but that doesn't mean that everybody is corrupt. There are a lot of Muslims in here who strove hard to live the life of a righteous Muslim. And they resent being told that everybody was corrupt, everybody was a liar, everybody was a thief, everybody was screwing somebody. That's not true. Absalom did the same thing to David. Yes, sir. Teach on him. He magnified the evils in David's court to show that he was more qualified for leadership over Israel than his own father, the king, put on the throne by God, David. But Absalom was the loser. Yes, sir. That's right. Antiochus became a miserable loser. As he was going up, it looked like nothing that he did failed. But as he coming down, it looked like everything is a mistake. But why? But why? Why did the Muslims go through all of this? I say this to the new ones. Don't try and judge the old Muslims. Don't do that. Don't say I met one of the old followers today. He ain't nothing. Don't do that. Because you don't know what they've been through. And I want to tell you in defense of the old Muslims. They died that you might have a right to the tree of life. They didn't even know the destiny that was there. They followed the messenger, but they didn't know they had to go to the cross. They wanted the crown, but you couldn't get the crown till you hit the cross. And the cross means crucifixion, and we wasn't about to go through that, but Allah said, I'm the best knower going through it. The book said, Jesus said, you don't take my life, I lay it down. He said, if the temple is destroyed, he said, if I destroy it, I'll rebuild it in three days. God is the destroyer here. But he needed an agent that would destroy it. And he found one right out of the sea of the messenger. Oh, that's heavy. That bears witness to the beginning. Yaqub was an original black man. He was one of our own, but he made the devil. Showing you that in the very nature of the black man, there is that crookedness, that wobble that's there that gives us trouble from time to time. And even though God chooses a messenger out of a family, that don't mean that there's a guarantee for his children. Because out of the same sperm that produced the original, out of that same sperm came the devil. Well, that's heavy. Now, where does the Bible say this? Oh, it's all over the Bible. We could go from Genesis all the way to Revelations, brother, and we don't have time to go there to think. 
But it's all there, and I thank Allah that he blessed me to wake up and to be awakened by a brother who came by my grave and said, Brother, it's time. Get up. I thank Allah that I'm able now, by his grace, to see a little better than I thought I saw in 1974 and 5. Beloved, look at this parable of Jesus. A man went forth to sow wheat in a field. Listen carefully. But while men slept, an enemy crept in and sowed tares in among the wheat. Isn't that a beautiful parable? Yes, <laughs> the people of the vineyard say, hey, we better pluck these up. He said, no, no, no. Let them grow together until the harvest time. Come on. And when the harvest has come, we will then separate the wheat from the tail. Uh -huh. Then Jesus gives us the meaning of the parable. He said the field is the world. The children of the kingdom are the wheat. And the children of Satan are the tail. And they're going to be together until the harvest time. And then God will separate out of his kingdom. Now this is not the world because the parable is a parable of the kingdom of heaven. That there's hypocrites in the kingdom. And look, some of us don't even know what we are. We come to join something, but we too cowardly to say I ain't with it. And not strong enough to walk the way it teaches. So we hang out in it, but use every opportunity to deviate from it. That's hypocrisy. Yeah, you can hide for a while. But the Quran says Allah sees what you do. And at a time that he sets, he's going to separate the house. Well, the messenger told us in 1957 that the nation was honeycombed with rotten characters, stew pigeons, and all of this kind of brother and sister. The, the police department sent people in, like they did tonight. Yes. <laughs> right? Now look, I'm not dumb enough to believe that everybody that's here tonight is with us. I mean, people come for all kinds of reasons. We don't care as long as you're here, it's fine. But Allah is watching. So people joined up in the nation. But they didn't really have the good of the nation at heart. They had their own thing at heart. Allah knows this. So the Quran teaches us in the 29th surah called the spider that Allah want to know the truthful from the liars. So he's going to send a test in there to manifest who is a liar and who is truthful. Now we can wrap it up. Look, beloved. It was at the crucifixion of Jesus that we found out who the liars were. And who the truthful were, who the weak were, and who the strong were. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. It was at that heavy trial on Job that we begin to find out where his family was, who his friends were, and Job began to get a good look at his own self. Yes, sir. Isn't that something? Yes, sir. It's in trial that you find out what each one of us is made of. You married to a man or the man married to you. You all think you love each other. And you say it every night. I love you, baby. I love you. I, love you, I mean, it sounds so good in the ear. You know what I mean? Oh, she really loves me. 
But God may know something more than you know. So a trial comes against the marriage. And then when a test comes inside the house, you begin to find out, uh-oh, maybe didn't love me like I thought. You got children that will follow you and be kind when you give them everything they want. You don't know that they're really yours. Well, I don't mean to suggest that anything funny went down, but I mean you don't know that they are really good children until you test them. My children, I used to put them to a test. I promised them something. Yes, I would. They hear, they can bear witness. And then when it came time to give it up, I would say, oh, I'm sorry. Something came up. And then I'd look in their face, and some of them would just walk out stomping. <laughs> See? If you only my son, when I got something to give you, okay. yes, sir. then when I don't have nothing to give you, will you still be my son? Come on. Are you my wife? Are you my wife because I can secure you now? Suppose I lose my job. Right. Come on. Don't you remember all the years that I did work and support you? Are you going to forget me now that I lost my job and start cussing me out? Uh -huh. Come on. See how short your memory is. <laughs> yes, sir. This is the way God work on you. Uh -huh. He want to make you see yourself as you really are. Uh -huh. Oh, brother and sister, if you do this for one another, how wise is the God to find out who the sincere followers of his messenger really is? Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> a man sowed wheat in a field, but while men slept, an enemy crept in. He crept right into the same field, but the folk went asleep. Did you hear the messenger say that Yaku made the Caucasian? That's not symbolic teaching. That's actual fact. Their own scholars are coming out with books now to verify the fact that they understand that there's something missing in the Caucasian. And it was in his grafting or in his making. This is not racist teaching. This is absolute fact that the Quran verifies that this book says that God wants you to know yourself and no others. And that's all the honorable Elijah Muhammad brought you was the knowledge of yourself and the knowledge of others. So the, the honorable Elijah Muhammad said the black man was put to sleep in order to allow this new man to exercise his rule. And God gave him 6,000 years. While men slept, an enemy crept in. You can't say we was wide awake. We was in a sleep state. Why? Allah decreed that we would sleep in order to allow Wallace the freedom to do his thing. All right. If you notice, he was unopposed. That's right. That's right. That's right. All these Muslims in here, they may have been cussing, they may have been fussing. That's right. They may not have liked it, but they couldn't interfere with it. That's right. And if Farrakhan didn't like what Wallace was doing and interfered with Wallace in the pursuit of what was his duty, then I wouldn't be alive today to bear witness, but you see, I'm on time. All right. He came on time, and I'm on time to do exactly what I'm doing. Yes, sir. By Allah's help, if you doubt it, God tells you right here in the scriptures that God's coming is after the working of Satan. Yes. You don't bring God and Satan on the scene and God come ahead of time. Come on. 
He comes on time. Right. He lets Satan have the freedom. Go do your thing, man. Uh-huh. Mess it up. Tear up the world, Satan. Uh-huh. And Satan did it. Right. Got 6,000 years of working on it. And don't tell me the world is not messed up. It take God himself to bring the earth back to order again. Is that right? Now, I want to do this for everyone that's in this audience to know that Farrakhan don't have no power on his own to resurrect the nation of Islam. You got to be able to look past me to see what backing the man has. And if the man is backed by God and the messenger of God, there is nothing that no combination of enemies can do to stop what I'm doing in America today in the name of Elijah Muhammad. <laughs> Now look, everybody all right? Teach us, brother. Come on. I'm going to finish up shortly. Take your time. You all right? Take your time. Yeah, you know we boogies all night sometimes. <laughs> but look, look, brothers and sisters, real quickly, real quickly, the same way Satan took the belief in the reality of God and put it in a mystery and ruled through the belief in a mystery God. Just remember that. Yaqub told them, according to the teaching of the messenger, question them on, where's the first one? And if they can't bring it, you got it showed his followers how to upset and undermine the belief of the people in the God. Boy, that's something. Turn it around. Put them to sleep. And when they go to sleep, have your way with them. Oh, brother and sister, I hope you follow me carefully. Every one of us who were taught by the messenger some of these brothers and sisters in here too were so heavy that when we went down to these colleges sat in these classrooms with the teaching of Elijah Muhammad yes, sir. we run the professor out of there yes, sir. Yes, sir. am I lying brothers no, sir. and sisters no, you were so heavy till the other college students began listening to you that's right. And the professor started listening to you too. That's right. And pretty soon you became the professor. That's right. Now all of a sudden, everything that Elijah Muhammad taught is a lie. All right? Now look, brothers. We had to go to sleep. For what? To give a modern Yaku. A chance to do the thing today that would bear witness to the thing that was done 6,000 years ago. Right. Now listen, if you don't think that you've been made into a devil, let me show you. And you have, and I had been made into snakes of a grafted type. All right. Come on, brother. You know, Yaqub was a big head scientist. That's right. <laughs> they said he had an exceptionally large head. Well, now if you look at the present leadership, no, 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 I'm not. I don't believe in mockery and foolishness. I really don't do that. I want to deal with this as a as a scientist. We are analyzing. He has an exceptionally large head, meaning a big head. He called himself every big name under the book from the manifestation of God in his first speech, the Immaculate Conception, the Christ, the Messiah, the Mahdi. All of these names he gave himself, but his work doesn't bear witness. 
to none of the names that he gave himself. Now, this is not I. This is just examination of his work. Oh, okay. It don't bear witness to that. That's right. That's right. Is that true? That's yes, right. sir. Well, if some of you got big heads. A lot of crazy fellas walking around here. I'm the Mahdi. I'm the Messiah. Um, you are you are terrible, brother. <laughs> I mean, that's a shame. It really is a shame, brother. As so many of us who got the teachings of the messenger are out ripping the people off with the little bit of knowledge we have, but our hearts are corrupt and we got something in it we want for ourselves and we're not really sincere for the honorable Elijah oh, Muhammad. Right. That's right. That kind of person will get trapped in his own madness. Yes, sir. You're playing with fire. You heard the messenger say, don't play with his teaching. It's a hot fire, brother. You do not play with this. And I must say to the 5% nation, the 5% nation survived because they were rooted in the lessons. Yes, That's right. He said, well, wait a minute. Farrakhan, we the 5%. Could be. But I'm saying those who called themselves 5 percenters, they didn't follow Wallace. That's right. Because they were rooted in the lessons. That's right. And if you, they are teaching, were teaching Islam, remember the Honorable Elijah Muhammad kept telling us, study your lessons, study your lessons, study your lessons. And we did not pay him the attention that we should have. Therefore, when the lessons begin to be carried out, we fail the lessons. I'll give you an example in a minute. Let's get on back to... <laughs> Go ahead. Yaqub. If you look now, Yaqub grafted from black into white. Yes. Physically. Ooh. Wallace started like Yaku by separating. If you remember, Yaku was talking to his uncle. His father wasn't present. Wallace didn't do none of this when his father was present. He only gave us a sign that this was in him. But when his father was gone, that's when he went to work. No, you didn't go crazy. You didn't go crazy. He did what he was destined to do. He had a destiny. Both of us come from the same father. He's from Elijah Muhammad, and I'm from Elijah Muhammad. Yes, sir. He's a destroyer, and I'm a builder. Yes, sir. Separate. Mm -hmm. yes, 
Right. Want to start the same? First and second resurrection. <laughs> yes, sir. You from the first, we from the second. Uh -huh. Immediately, if you wanted to belong, you had to get out of the first into the second. <laughs> yes, sir. Come on. <laughs> Pretty soon, all the old followers of the messenger were put right on out, right. driven out, uh -huh. sit down, uh -huh. because he wanted the new one. And if you watch, just like Yaqub took the white man out of the black, and in his final stage, he began to hate the very root out of which he came. Wallace has produced a people that hate black. <laughs> and they hate the very teacher and teaching that gave them life. That's right. Oh, yes. As the Quran said, you hate Allah as well as his messenger because they enrich you out of his grace. There never was a teacher ever walk among us that taught us the wisdom like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. No man. Now look. Yahoo was given 6,000 years. Mm -hmm. Wallace was given six years. Yeah. Right. Come on. Yeah. And if you doubt that he's on his way out, you keep watching. Yeah. Come on. And see, don't nobody have to touch him. That's not your job. It's not my job. Just yes, sir. God want him to live to see his father's work come up out of the dust and encompass him. Yes. It's coming up out of the dust, black man. Whether you like it or not, it's coming up. Oh, praise the to Allah. The man had a field day talking about the messenger. He called the messenger a lie. He called the messenger a wicked man, an adulterer, a fornicator, a jealous-hearted man, a master of tricks. Come on, that's what he said. All right, if he's so bad and you so good, then justify it by your works. Here the messenger been gone six years, and you've been dead. Six years. Come on. Look, and as the world of black people have been scattered to the four winds, the nation of Islam has been scattered to the four winds. Every one of your minds have been shut out in space. You went, I went. We went in every different direction. Some of us haven't seen each other for years until Sunday at the Armory or tonight. It's true, beloved. We were gone, scattered, and we became exactly what the Bible says. Dry bones in the valley. It's talking about black people in general, but the nation of Islam in particular. You and I have been talking. That's right. Oh man. Can these bones live? That's right. Oh man. Can these bones live? Come on. Oh Lord, only thou know it. Oh, can we get these brothers and sisters together again? Look at your minds. Some of us have said I'll never follow a man as long as I live. Some of us have said I wish I had never met him. Oh man, some of us went back to Eden Hall. Born with white women and white men. I mean, we went crazy, brothers and sisters. And look at how far we've gone. Listen to this now. And the world say it's impossible. You never get the nation together. Look at this now. Oh, Allah, I thank him so much, man. Yes, sir. Thank God. Yes, sir. The dry bones. Look at us. What are the bones saying? Our hope is lost. Our bones are dry. 
we have cut off from our part some of these Muslims remember the nation faintly and say well it was a good thing but it's gone forever just never gonna come back uh, my life is ruined I've spent 20 years 25 years some spent 30 years some spent 10 years it's, it's over see you and I have become the lost sheep you see it the lost sheep you know what the word lost means incorrigible so messed up you can't be corrected irreformable so crooked now you can't be straightened out irreconcilable so far gone back into the world you could never be brought back to the law and to God and to yourself hopeless past praying for dead this you this is me this is us you are also styled as the prodigal son look at you beloved when I look at some of these beautiful faces here that I remember so well I know your power and I know your greatness by Allah's help but you and I took our substance from daddy and we went into a strange country to try to join ourselves on to be a citizen in a strange land check it out have not we done it? Yes, sir. We tried to be Arabs. <laughs> yes, sir. That's what we did. Yes, we dressed up like the Arabs. Uh -huh. Every third word was Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Yes, sir. Alhamdulillah, right. Alhamdulillah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm not making no mockery. Yes, but we wanted to show the Arabs we were, we were trying to be like them. They used to, when I was in Mecca, one white Arab came out of Pennsylvania and talked about how the whole mosque in Pennsylvania, he was teaching them how to pray. And he was bragging to his other cohorts in Mecca, oh, they're coming and we are teaching them to pray. At last they're praying properly. <laughs> Come on, brother. And I'm in Mecca with him. And I'm hot. Yes, sir. I ain't jiving. Yes, sir. We battling in Mecca. Ma. He throw one, I throw one back. Ma. I'm throwing for Elijah yes, Muhammad, man. I, I'm supposed to be with Wallace, but the message is so deep in me. I'm over there. I don't want nobody talking about that man. So they must have said to each other, that nigga ain't straight yet. <laughs> they said too much Elijah in here. That nigga ain't right yet. <laughs> Minister Larry was there with me. He was beating them back from around the black stone so I could get in and kiss it. And the woman in front of me, she was licking the stone. This is the truth. She was so enamored over the stone, you know. And I got in there behind and I kissed it too. But after I kissed the stone, I said, Oh, Allah, if I could just find the grave where they say my Lord is, I will knock on the grave and say, Dear Apostle, you were right. Mm -hmm. These are signs here. That's right. That's right. I said, We cannot follow signs. We must get the meaning of what the signs and symbols represent. Yes, sir. Oh, beloved. There in Mecca, I came to myself too. I know your strengths. I know how you felt because I put the Bible down. I put the Quran down. I didn't want nothing more to do with religion at all. I hated religion. I begin to think religion is like different colored glasses. You got on your Jehovah Witness glasses. I got on my Muslim glasses. 
This one got on his Christian glasses. Somebody got on their Baptist glasses. And each of these glasses got a different tint. So I'm looking at the world through my green. You looking at the world through your blue. You looking at the world through your yellow. And can't none of us see out of the same eye. I said, if everybody bust them damn glasses, maybe we'll see each other at last, you know? Now look, I'm just telling you what I went through. I threw my Bible away, threw the Quran away. I ain't want nothing no more. I don't want no religion, but I was in Mecca. I'm checking things out. Brothers and sisters, you went through it, and I went through it. We became lost sheep. We became prodigal sons. We tried to join on to America again, remember? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did it. Yes, sir. We went back to white folks and began to apologize to them for calling them the devil. That's right. As though the messenger had lied to us, and I'm very, very sorry about this racist talk. <laughs> and picked up a white girl and started walking right down Eastern Parkway. <laughs> right down Nostrand Avenue. Right down Bedford. And we used to be bringing the lost found to the temple, man. Strutting. Look at that nigga there with that white woman. <laughs> and here we are walking right by the temple with a white woman. Yes, sir. That's right. Say, man, I'm ashamed, but I used to believe that something was wrong with you, honey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother and sister, we went to hell. Now, as messed up as we are, the world thinks we could never be brought back again. But that prodigal son, it said he got so low, he was feeding swine and husking corn. And if you look at black people, what it actually means is swine love filth. And we, the righteous, had begun to feed filth okay. to the people who love filth. Okay. Yes. We begin selling dope again. Thanks. Thanks. We begin hustling women again. Yes, sir. We begin doing all the wrong things. We began to feed swine. You understand? Yes, sir. And when you husk corn, you pull away from the corn its protective cover and the nature of the atmosphere begin to eat away the life in the corn. Oh, but the scriptures say God brought a famine in the land. Most of us as Muslims squandered our intelligence following these demons. And after a while, you lost everything. Check it out. You lost your wife. We lost our children. Yes, sir. We lost our minds. Yes, sir. We lost our businesses. Right. We lost our cars. Very few of us look the same. That's right. We lost our look as a civilized person. Uh -huh. We begin to look wild and crazy. Like the Quran said when they rejected Moses, he turned them into apes and swine. Right. Yes, sir. We became swine and begin living like apes again. Did you hear? Yes, sir. You know it's right, brothers and sisters. Yes, but when the famine got so tough, the prodigal son said, I think. He began to think. See, God had to make you think. He took everything away from you. In the third year, I stood up. I wasn't late. I was on time. The nation was supposed to rise after the third day. You the Jesus that was crucified looking for Elijah. Listen good. You the one nation of Islam that whose hands were nailed. These mighty hands that built for black people in New York. Look at them. They nailed. The feet that walk the path of righteousness, mm -hmm. the nail, yes, the mind that used to be so clear and lucid, uh -huh. a crown of thorns on your head, pierced in your side, 
and the blood, the moral life that Elijah Muhammad taught us is leaving us fast. We're going down, 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 down. And the book said he gave up the ghost. Meaning you give up the spirit of Islam. You don't want the life of Islam no more. And in the last hour he cried out, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, my God. My God, why have you forsaken me? Why? That's a question again. Why am I dying like this? Why am I hanging here like this? Why can't I work like I used to work? Why can't I talk like I used to talk? Why can't I live like I used to live? But Allah cried out, I am the best no. Stay there and die, boy. But on the third day, you will rise again. Boy, look at this. Go read your Bible. You was laid in a tomb. And a stone was at the mouth of your grave. Yes, dear brothers. The stone represents the hard-hearted, wicked nature. And the hardness of their wicked life keeps you in the tomb. But like Peter denied Jesus, but yet Jesus found favor in Peter. He said, though you deny me, Peter, I prayed for you. He said, look, I'm going to turn you into the hands of Satan like Job was turned into the hand of Satan. He said, the devil desires you that he may sift you as wheat. The messenger looked me right in my face and said, the devil desires you that he may sift you as wheat. The second part of that in scripture is, but I prayed for you that your faith may not fail you altogether. Knew that Peter's faith was going to fail him, but it wouldn't be a complete faith. He said, but when you have returned to me, Peter, go and strengthen your brethren. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Look at this. I was in Wallace's hands. He took me out of New York. Stripped me from the seat of power in the city. Yes, sir. Yes, he did. I was well known here and well loved here. You may not believe it, but I never did one thing against the nation of Islam or any one of you, not knowingly. But anything I did, it was in ignorance. And for that, I have come to you that I have harmed in ignorance and pardoned you publicly. You remember, you ain't that damn dead. (laughs) I handle hundreds of thousands of your dollars into the millions. But this is not a robber. Not one dime did I take from you. Not as much as a dime or as little as a penny. But those who accuse me, let them bring the proof or die on it. Because I'm willing to die on it. You don't need no applause. I'm willing to die on it. And I'm willing to snatch your damn tongue straight out of your mouth if you don't have no damn proof for what you say. You don't know your lesson. Why did we run Yakub and his made devil from the root of civilization? He started making trouble among the righteous, telling lies. He accused the righteous, causing them to fight and kill one another. All you have is accusations, but you don't prove nothing. You don't care, but it's a disease in your heart that make you believe the worst of your brother rather than believe the best and you walk with me. And I walk with you. And many of you that walk close to me, you know that I never said nothing to you other than what Elijah Muhammad taught me to teach you. Whatever I had, I shared it.
did with you. But you hated me like they hate Elijah because God blessed me with success. Even as it was with Cain and Abel. Come on, talk to me. Drive on, brother. Tell them all Jesus all night. Cain and Abel were children of one father. That's right. But Cain was jealous of his brother Abel because he was Abel. And it always is that way. When God bless somebody with ability, the others, instead of joining him, Nourishing from him and manifesting their own ability. Right. The evil disease of envy and jealousy come up in their heart and then murder come up in their heart. When he took me out of New York, he brought into this city ministers who actually hated me from envy and jealousy. And since that time, they've come and confessed to me. Yes, sir. I'm telling you what I know. They bear me witness. They confess, brother. You're the only one of all the messengers ministers that's standing up, lifting up his name. You're the only one of all of us major ministers. Yes, sir. That's the truth. Thank you. And God is blessing me for doing it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you can't see God with me, mm -hmm. then you're blind. That's right, sir. That's right. That's right. But if you can see that God is with me, you should be with me. That's right. And help me to lift his name up all over America because you were taught and you were trained by him. And there's an ocean of black people out there that need what you already been through. That's right. Look at it, beloved. Take them up. Take them up. He brought me to Chicago. Asked me to teach once a month. Brought Minister Larry, called him Aziz, brought him to Chicago. Then I was teaching once every other month. I was like a man in a holding pattern. You run him around in circle till he run out of gas. He put me over a temple on the west side, up over a storefront. Our worst little temple in New York didn't look like that one. But my sons will bear me witness. They saw me drive to that temple and go up in it with no proudness and teach and never open my mouth to speak evil of the man that sent me there to teach. He was trying me to break me, but God was having him to make me into the man that I'm becoming right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is not the same Farrakhan that you knew, beloved. I've been to hell and I'm back. I've been dead and I'm alive. How in the hell can I be the same man that I was? He brought my assistant minister, Minister Larry, and sent us both down in Chicago and said, Brother, I want you to meet your new boss and laughed in my face. Yeah, listen at it. And I took Minister Larry out to dinner. And I said to him, brother, as you serve me in New York, I will serve you in Chicago. Those that criticize Farrakhan, they don't know his heart. You never saw your brother. You saw the apparent arrogance, and it was there. You saw that vanity, it was there. But God saw it too. But he saw deeper than you. He saw in the man something of value and he's the best knower. So he put me under Satan. Come on. 
that I could go down into hell before I ascended into heaven because you had to go down into hell before you could ascend into heaven. That's the path of Jesus. Yes, sir. Yes. You got to go down before you can go up. Have you been down? Yes, sir. Well, there ain't no way for you to go now but up. This is the resurrection and this is the ascension. You're coming up from death for the second and for the last time. In the third year, God blessed me through a brother who came by my grave. I'm struggling to get up. I came here to New York and saw you and I cried. As bad a shape as I was in, I looked at brothers that were so clean they were on cocaine. And I saw their faces in the Randall's Island at a little speaking engagement and I felt bad. And I went to Wallace and I said, brother, if we can iron out our differences, I'll go back to New York and help out. Not out of lust for money, but I love New York and I love you. And I hated to see you ruin your lives. And it seemed like you wasn't going to get up. And just in between that time, I told uh, the imam, I said, we have to iron out our differences. He said, go on back and we will iron them out at another time. I said, I can't do that. I said, because if I stand up on the rostrum in temple number seven, the believers will know that I'm not with you 100%. And I said, so let us iron out these difficulties. And the main difficulty I had was his feelings about his father. I wrote him about it. I sent him a tape on it and talked to him personally. He knows these things. And if he were here, he would bear me witness. He knows the heart of this brother because he tried me in a way that you could never try me. And I heard him say once, he believed the brother got a good heart. He don't believe it. He know it. Because if I didn't have a good heart, we'd have killed till blood was running everywhere. But I know that there's a God bigger than him and bigger than me. And what my father set in motion, I will not disrespect it. That's his boy, his son, and he will deal with his son, and the God will deal with his son, and the God will deal with the Muhammad family. They're not for you to judge, nor me to judge. That's right. That's right. Leave them alone and let God judge them. Get on up out of your grave and let's go on and rebuild the house of our father. And I'm telling you, we can do it overnight. <laughs> <laughs> so in my conclusion beloved we had to know how to begin how do you begin to rebuild a work like this I'm hated by Bilalians and I was hated by the followers of the messenger who saw me go with Wallace. What am I gonna do? Hated on both sides. But I never asked one of these, come join me. I never said, I'm gonna stand up brothers. Will you stand up with me and protect me? I ain't asked nobody nothing. When the time came for me to stand up, I stood up. And if God want me alive, he'll protect me. Because you cannot protect me if God don't want me alive. And brothers and sisters, I decided to follow the messenger's directives. He said to me, remember brother, when a seed germinates in the earth, it sends a root down before it sends a shoot up. And I went underground. Malcolm died, I'd say this again and again, that I might live. 
If Malcolm had not made the mistake that he made, I couldn't have walked as rightly as I've walked in this effort to rebuild thus far. You may say, well, how is that? When Malcolm broke from the messenger, he didn't get out of the public. He kept on on TV. And you can't make a program on TV. You can't think and organize on TV. You got to withdraw. Darkness is where babies are made. Come on. Darkness is where ideas are formed. So after I made my stand, I put it in the Amsterdam News. I'm standing up for the Hobie Elijah Muhammad. And then I went underground. Went right underground. And brothers and sisters, this is true. <clears throat> I said, if I had set up a temple then, the hatred that was there for the messenger, and for me particularly, brother, our Bilalian brothers and sisters would have swooped down on the little followers of Elijah Muhammad, there would have been bloodshed. Do you think anybody that loves the messenger want to see Muslims kill Muslims? We don't want that. No. So I said, well, I don't care what they say about me. I'm not going to answer. And everything that was said against me and some terrible things were said, I heard them and I kept right on going. I never answered back. And after a while I said, if I just be quiet, the messenger told me, you don't have to condemn a dirty glass. Just set a clean glass up beside it. So while they were condemning me, and I knew that the old Muslims, your faith and confidence in Brother Farquhar had been completely shattered. Well, some of you. <laughs> and I said, well, there's nothing for me to do but work hard. And brothers and sisters, we went to work. Yes, you did, and Allah blessed us. Yes. Honest and truthfully. Oh, yeah. Allah blessed us. And now the lost, look at it. They're coming. Yes. And they've been found. Right. Let's look at the bones. Uh -huh. You see them getting together? Yes, sir. Come on. That's right. Do you see the prodigal son coming home? Yes, sir. But then this is not our work. Is it not my work? This is Allah and the Messenger's work. Right. So don't give no credit to me. That's right. Give it to where it rightfully belongs. Because as long as you think this is Farrakhan, then you can excuse yourself. That's right. mm. But if you know the boy is backed by God, then you have no excuse to turn me down when I'm calling you back to the work that you started and went away from. Now you must come back and come let's back. get busy and rebuild the house, the nation of Islam. Why? 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 To prove his power. Why did God make devil? He wanted to prove his power. That he could give him time and let him do what he wanted to do. And in one day, come up and destroy all his work and return it back to where it was in the beginning to prove that he, Allah is God, always has been and he always will be. Why did he let it happen? He let it happen because the nation of Islam was too arrogant. Okay, okay. Our father was doing the work and we were strutting among our poor lost found brothers and sisters. God don't like arrogance. He don't like proud people. Mm -hmm. These are our people and we shouldn't go to them like we think we're better than they are. Right. Right. We had to be taught a lesson. Yes, sir. We had become a little corrupt. Yes. And if we had continued on that path, mm -hmm. the nation would have been totally destroyed anyway. Yes, Wallace was only doing what Allah permitted. Yes. Allah permitted the nation to be torn down so he could rebuild it properly, rightly, on a perfect foundation laid by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. When you go home tonight, beloved, you pick up your Quran, 
If you don't have one, we have a few Qurans here. They're going pretty fast. And since they, since they, um, they, you know, cut us off from all the messengers' books, the believers around the country begin contributing to me. And I took all of the money that they gave to me and I bought up the whole warehouse of the messengers' books. And, because the only way you're going to be a strong Muslim is not to follow me, but to follow the messenger and his word that are found in his writings. Now, I don't want to miss this point. You open up your Quran to the 18th chapter. Moses travels in search of knowledge. And when you go there, you'll find Moses questioning the wise man, right? And the wise man said, I told you you couldn't follow me. And Moses said, yes, I can, yes, I can. And they came to a river. And there was a boat, and the man allowed the wise man to use his boat. Then when they got over on the other side, he put a hole in the boat, sunk the boat. And Moses said, this is a horrible thing that you've done. And the wise man said, I told you, you couldn't follow me. They went on a little further. There was a little boy that the parents loved. And the wise man caused the little boy to die. And Moses said, good gracious, this is a terrible thing you've done. You killed that woman's child. And the wise man said, Moses, I told you you couldn't follow me without questioning me. And last, they went to a house where the people had food and they were on a journey and they were hungry. And they wouldn't ask for no food. And Moses said, well, why don't you ask the people, you know, for their food? And the wise man went to a wall, and he built up the people's wall. He said, well, look, man, why would you build the people's wall? They refused you hospitality. You build up their wall. You could have built their wall and asked them for some money, then we could have got some food. (laughs) In other words, the wise man always looked foolish to the fool because his knowledge wasn't comprehensive enough. Do you understand it? Then before the wise man left, he said, now I'll explain to you what I did. He said, the boat, I knew wicked king was coming after me and he was confiscating all the people's boats. And this was a good man. And I didn't want the wicked king to take his boat. So I put a hole in the boat. And it it sunk. But after that wicked king goes by, the man will be able to go back and get his boat and bring it up, patch up the hole, and his boat will be like new again. As for the woman and and, and the man that had this child, I could see that the child, when it grows up, was going to be wicked and give great pain to the mother and father who were righteous parents. So I took the life of that child to spare the mother and the father grief as the child grew older. But I've already given the mother another child that is a righteous child that will bring the mother great joy and the father great happiness. And as for that wall that I built up, I knew that there was a treasure in that wall. And I knew that an orphan boy, that treasure was put there for the orphan. Mm, mm, mm. He said, but I knew that the wicked would come out and find the treasure, so I built up the wall to hide the treasure. And at a certain time when the orphan comes of age, he'll come by that wall and his treasure will be exposed to him. He said, I told you, you couldn't follow me because it's difficult to follow that of which you have no comprehensive knowledge. And now we must part company. And what is the meaning of this? Part, brother. Go ahead, brother. The boat 
is our nation. The boat is our faith that floats on the buoyancy of the truth. He knew that a wicked king was coming to destroy the boats, to destroy the faith. So he put a hole in the boat to let the waters rush in so that the faith would sink but not be completely destroyed. I put a hole in the nation so the nation would go down but the nation is still intact. You are the nation and you may look bad but you are intact. Now what did I mean? The wicked king came and he confiscated everything. Yes, sir. But look, the nation is intact. All we got to do is go pull it up out of the depth of the sea of sin and plug up the hole in his face. Come on. Clean off the carbuncles. Clean it up and say, here's my ship. My boat is brand new again. Look at us. We went back in the world. Fell all the way down. And when we woke up, we wasn't as clean as we are right now. We looked rough like a ship coming up out of deep water, brother. It looks bad. Like some of you in here tonight. You Muslim, but you look terrible. Your face reflects the grave. But don't worry about it. Because the scripture says, that when he got through, he said, I am the resurrection yes, sir. Okay. and the life. Uh -huh. If you believe in me, though you are dead, yet shall you live. But you got to come back to believe. And when you come back to believe, you come back to life. And then we'll be able to say, oh grave, where is thy victory, yes, oh death? Where is thy sting? Yes, come on, Muslim. Come on. Let's bring the boat on up and show the world the boat is intact. Got a little hole in it. Got a little dirty and funky from the depth of the sea, but we'll get it all together in a short while. Who is the baby here? The baby stands for the nation again. The mother and the father of this nation, Master Farad Muhammad and his messenger, produced a child and the child had an ugly future because the path that we were going in so corrupted with the agents and whatnot and our own corruption, eventually we would have brought great grief to Allah and the messenger. So the scripture says the wise one took the life of the baby, but he gave him another one that would be righteous. The Quran says a new generation would be raised up. And they won't be like the first group. The second group will be better than the first group. You heard the messenger say that. And now a whole new group of people is coming up. A new baby that loves Elijah Muhammad and never saw his face. Never heard his voice, but love him. Oh yeah, this is the new baby coming up. And the orphan, and the orphan, and the orphan. The orphan is you and me. Mama gone. Daddy gone. The motherless child has seen a hard time, boy. We have had a hard time, but, but the father knew we were going to need some treasure when we got up. Daddy knew we was going to need some bucks when we got up. Because you can't build no nation with no nickels and dimes. So he buried it in a wall. And they thought he was building up the wall, doing a righteous act for them while he was looking out for the orphan that would grow to maturity and collect what had been laid up for him. I tell you, beloved, I'm not worried. We're going to rebuild this house. Come on, James, seven next. You're close and waiting for you. Oh, yeah, brother. That's a preacher there, man. Look at all these former Muslims. With all the former followers of the messenger, would you just stand up? Those that followed the messenger, look at them. Look at them. Praise be Look at them. Stand up. Just stand up.
Just stand up. No, 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 don't sit down. Don't sit down. Please stand up. Please stand up, please. Let me say this to you all. You've been taught. You've been trained. Look at all our brothers and sisters out there that don't know what you know. Come on, mighty Muslim. Come on. Come on. All we got to do is put the plug back in the boat. Come on. Yes, sir. Plug up your faith yes, sir. and let it get it strong again. And you can help. We've got sisters coming all over this country. Young little girls who want to live a righteous and clean life. But there's no one to teach them righteousness. Because the sisters that know, well, they haven't gotten confidence yet. And Brother Farrakhan to say, well, I think he really is trying to follow the messenger. Let me go help him. Brothers and sisters, if I'm not trying to follow the messenger, you can have my life. Listen. Take my life and do with it whatever you please. Kill me and send my body in every direction. I love Elijah Muhammad. He's the only man we have. And I don't know no one worthy of being lifted up for the black man and woman, but the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I'm not interested in no self-exaltation. I'm not interested in no honor. I deeply appreciate it, but I don't deserve it. I'm just doing my duty. And I say to you, beloved, as God bless me to come back to myself, he will bless you too. Yes, sir. And I don't care what you did since you've been out. I don't care how low we fell. Don't worry about the past. The problem book says, what are you doing today for yourself? Your brother from the east wants to know and hear from you at once. Don't worry about yesterday. Allah will wipe all of that out if you come on and get back on the road and do your job. Where's Lieutenant Richard A. Day? Oh, Richard. Beloved brother Richard, we could ever forget your soldiery. No, 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 you think, do you think what they could ever forget how you made us do what they wanted to do? Brother, your work was not in vain. Sisters, your work was not in vain. Please be seated. Look at these wonderful Muslims. Your work was not in vain. I'm going to leave you. I hate to be you, but I'm, I'm happier looking at you. And my brothers can tell you, I feel more joy seeing one of the old soldiers come back home. Yes, sir. Because I know what he's been through. Yes, sir. He and she, beloved Muslims. Mm, mm, mm. You remember that story about the woman that was found in adultery? And they asked a woman, we caught you in the act. And everybody got their stones ready to throw. And Jesus said, wait a minute. Which one of you is without sin? You know, cast the first stone. And he said, woman, where are your accusers? And they had all gone. And he said, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Now, don't you know when a woman is caught in adultery, she didn't get caught in a bed by herself. But the scriptures, the scriptures don't ever tell you that the woman that was caught in adultery came with a man. Didn't that something if she was caught and she was caught with the man? You know who the woman is? The woman is the nation of Islam. The nation of Islam laid down in bed with a strange guy. And we were caught in the act of adultery. Yes, and we brought back before our master and teacher. And everybody is about to stone the old Muslim. And the Jesus comes up to defend you. And he says, just a minute. Any of you that are without sin, pick up your stone and throw it. And since there's nobody without sin, then the Jesus forgave the woman of her sin 
and said, neither do I accuse you. Go, go, and sin. No more. Yes, sir. Come on, my son.